Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Fred and Lou Hartwig family, Peter and Barbara Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize, and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics this week. New mayor, new council, new manager, new financial forecast in Kansas, and the political forecast includes an increasing chance of impeachment, plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and hear from one of the candidates for the third district at large city council seat in the June 18th election. Joining me is the Reverend Wallace Hartsfield II, pastor of the Metropolitan Missionary Church. His opponent was my guest last week. Reverend Hartsfield, welcome to Ruckus. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. I'm sure you're a busy man running a large congregation. Why do you want to take on the added responsibilities of serving on the council? Well, I, um, I think this is a natural outgrowth of, of my faith. Um, it's kind of hard to uh, think about faith without faith ultimately being made public. Um, but being more pointed about it, I'm, I'm running in this race because I care very deeply about the well-being of our, of our city. And I'm committed to its optimal function, that of providing excellent services and equitable opportunities. Moreover, I'm, I'm compassionate uh, for the diversity of voices that create our city. But I think most importantly, I'm willing to cooperate with the mayor, other city council members, city staff, community partners, residents, in order to make our city the best city it can be. And it will be the best when wherever we are in our city, that we are in safe, prosperous, yeah. and growing You're neighbors. running from the third district, but you're running citywide. Yes. Uh, the third district is on the east side of Kansas City. Yes. What are some of the most significant problems in the third that you'd like the city council to deal with and try to solve? Well, the rampant violence that threatens our neighborhoods, uh, for me, would probably have to be at the top. Uh, but then there's a the whole matter of menial jobs uh, that really are not quality nor are they sustainable. Um, and then I would think that we would be, have to talk about affordable housing. Unfortunately, the housing choices are ridiculous for many persons, uh, especially in the third district, because they have to choose between housing that is oftentimes unaffordable or uh, housing that is substandard. Uh, and then, never, uh, then there are those distressed communities that have been neglected uh, that also need to be addressed. Is 18th and Vine in your district? Yes, 18th and Vine. What do you think is going to happen with the Jazz Museum? What should happen? Well, absolutely, we should put the necessary investment in place to make this a reality. 18th and Vine is central, not just to the history of African Americans uh, as it relates to music in this city. Uh, Kansas City can't be what Kansas City is without 18th. And why, why hasn't it ever been truly successful in, in the modern era? Well, I think a lot of that has had to do with possibly leadership uh, and real vision with regard to it. But maybe most importantly, and especially as a city council person would think about it, uh, the investment has not been there at the local city level, maybe at the level it should have been. But you think the, the 18th and Vine Jazz District will be saved somehow and will prosper? Well, it's not going to be saved on its own. It's going to only be saved. But that's a you goal have, you could consider. Absolutely. I mean, and I would be one of the city council persons to do that. As a big jazz fan, I'm glad to hear you say that. Yes. Uh, as you well know, Kansas Cityans just rejected a sales tax for pre-K uh, pre education, mm -hmm. three-eighths of a cent. And uh, some analysts are saying that's because Kansas Cityans believe they've been taxed enough. Do you think Kansas Cityans have been taxed enough? Yes, uh, I, I do believe that. But I think uh, we have not been as responsible and strategic with our taxing. And I think that was the problem, one of the problems with regards to what the mayor uh, had, had put forth. Uh, 
we're going to have to do better with how we make use of the taxes uh, here. All right, one final quick question. Should the Paseo Boulevard name be changed as the city council has directed to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, or should it go back to Paseo as some people are now suggesting? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm for it being changed, all right? But uh, what I would say is, is this, is that um, I understand what the ministers were trying to do as far as to celebrate the name of King, and I'm for that. I also understand what the residents are seeking to do. Unfortunately, this has really fractured our community, and we're going to need a road to reconciliation. Uh, we're going to really need that to take but place. But you favor the name Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Yes, I say. Okay. Yes, Thank you very much for coming in. Good luck in the campaign. Thank you. That is City Council candidate Reverend Wallace Hartsfield II. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus! John Stevens is president and CEO of Port KC. Annie Presley is a writer, publisher, and political fundraiser. Chris Reeves is a Kansas representative on the Democratic National Committee, making his first appearance on Ruckus. Uh, welcome to the program, Chris. Welcome. Dave Traubert is president of the Kansas Policy Institute. Just before we start, I want to mention Annie has a book coming out I do. later this week. It's called Sam Gets Adopted. What, it, what is it about? I'm so excited. It's our older black mutt we adopted and um, from Wayside Waves. Rainy Day Books is doing our launch on Saturday down at Barquet. Very excited about it. And the funds that you raise go to Wayside Waves. Wait. It's a great book for three to eight-year-olds who are thinking about getting a dog. All right, thank you. Moving on, the mayor council elections in Kansas City are still a few weeks away. In the mayor's race, endorsements continue to roll in. Jolie Justice got the nod of Forward KC and Northland Group. Quentin Lucas gained the backing of the police union. He's also been endorsed by the firefighters. Regardless of the outcome, Kansas City will have a new mayor and a lot of new council members. It does not seem a stretch to wonder whether Kansas City will soon have a new city manager. Troy Schulte's contract ends next March. Do you think he stays or goes? And we start with John. Well, I don't know if he stays or goes, but I think that uh, definitely he has uh, been a steady hand uh, at the wheel of the city. You can always criticize in this position. I mean, that's a, a very powerful position in Kansas City, Missouri, as a city manager position. Um, I hope that he stays through the transition. As you said, we're going to have a new mayor, significant turnover on the council. There's going to be a lot of issues ahead that we need to see through with the airport, the geo bonds, a lot of things. I think having the steady hand of uh, Troy Schulte uh, there at City Hall for at least a couple more years would be valuable. What do you think, Annie? He has been very steady. I agree with John. And what I really like about him, he's kept such a nice low profile. The council members are out doing wasn't, all the wasn't talking. wasn't a low profile when he and the mayor came out and announced uh, KCI was being destroyed and a new airport was being built and Burns and McDonald were going to build it. Well, that was a misstep. I, well, <laughs> I'll concede that. But otherwise, he's not been a talker in front of the TV. He just hadn't been there. So well, you know, sometimes you have conflicts between a city manager and mayor, and we've not seen much of it in the Sly James years. No, and, and that may be because, as Annie said, he keeps a low profile. Uh, but there, there have been over the years, and in, in, in it's pretty typical in, in a lot of cities to have conflicts between mayors and city managers, uh, partly because the mayor really doesn't have much authority in that type of a, well, a structure. And I don't think people understand that. I, I, you know, doing no. radio talk shows for years, have the mayor as a guest, people would call in, and they think the mayor can do anything, solve anything. <laughs> and that's just not true in the Kansas City, Missouri. No, it's not. System. But it's not surprising that, that people don't understand yeah. that. There's a, as much of a self-promoter as Mayor James is, there's probably people in Kansas City who don't know they couldn't name the mayor. So not knowing how government works uh, is, is not a surprise. We don't even teach that very much in, in school these days. Sure. Turning to the mayor's race for a second, Chris, a lot of endorsements are coming out. Uh, Jolie Justice got the UAW endorsement just yesterday. Do you think these are important in a mayor's race? You know, in a, in a race for a local uh, election, like mayoral or uh, county commissioner, a lot of times it's the infrastructure that gets behind you that can propel you to win because they're the people that can actually turn out their voters. Um, these are really low attention races. A lot of people, even in a big race like mayor of Kansas City, Missouri, you're not going to see huge voter turnout. 
So whoever can turn out their base, well, that's well, certainly if the primary is any indication, we won't see a large turnout in the uh, general election, which is June the 18th. Do you have any sense of how the mayor's race is developing? No, I, I, I think, as we said, with local, with local races like this, now that you're down to two, both candidates have an opportunity to try to get their message across on how they're going to lead. I think the key issue that should be asked is how are they going to work with this new council? Uh, there's a lot of issues ahead. And once again, the mayor, uh, the mayor may not have a lot of power, but they have agenda-setting power. And they have, uh, as I think Sly has said before, they're the head cheerleader. And so they can really move forward and set an agenda and then the council either chooses to follow them or not. Mayor has the bully pulpit, the as, bully pulpit as people yeah. like to say. Uh, so, Annie, don't mayors like to pick their own city managers? I think they do, and there's a little bit of pressure throughout Kansas City for these candidates to go ahead and say whether or not he's going to stay mm. or go. And that's kind of a sticky wicket since they both have worked with him mm. as current council members. I'm not sure that they'll be willing to do that, but they could give an indication as to whether or not they will, re how they feel about renewing his contract in March. Since uh, Sly James has endorsed Jolie Justice, and, and <laughs> she seems to be in accord with much of what he wants to do, you would think she'd be comfortable with Schulte. I'm not so sure about Lucas. I don't know. I, I'm not sure how they'll feel about it, and I think they are going to get a lot of public pressure to say something as to whether or not they'll mm -hmm. renew his contract or even yeah. take a look at it. Well, there are going to be about 400 debates between the two candidates for mayor, so it shouldn't be difficult for people to get some sense of uh, what each one of the uh, two candidates stands for. Kansas City Star headline from about a week ago said, after years of budget turmoil, Kansas revenue is stable, but officials urge caution. The cautionary note may result from a couple of things. The legislature and governor have yet to reach agreement on a budget, and the Supreme Court has yet to rule on whether $360 million more over four years will adequately fund school finance requirements. State legislators return to work on May the 1st. So is that headline right? Kansas revenue is stable, but caution is required. We'll start with Dave. Well, Mike, like many McClatchy headlines, it's both <laughs> misleading and politically motivated. Uh, you know, tax revenue is at record levels. They call it stable. It's at record levels, and it's growing partly because Governor Kelly just vetoed a, a bill that would have prevented another tax increase from the federal windfall. So when you talk about caution, uh, of course there needs to be caution, but it's designed to discourage efforts to roll back that latest tax increase. Uh, the reality is, is and, and media knows this, they've all seen the numbers, they won't talk about it. Kansas is facing over a billion dollar shortfall over the next four years, and they don't want people to know it because what's really happening is all these spending plans are setting Kansans up for a huge tax increase again. And let me point out your website, or at least uh, the news information that, that you folks send out at the Kansas Policy Institute, describes all these situations in detail. We describe it in detail. It's not our numbers. The numbers come from Kansas legislative research that were produced at the request of a state legislator. And we've shared all that information with media. So there is no question they have this data. They just don't want to talk about it because that would confirm you cannot do what Governor Kelly and others have said, which is spend all this money without a tax increase. Chris, you think Kansas revenue is stable, but we ought to be cautious? I, th I think being cautious is correct. Um, I think, uh, unfortunately, the very hastily draft Trump tax plan did, unfortunately, cause a lot of states to be in a bad position in that there are people who used to be able to itemize their taxes suddenly <coughs> couldn't because Trump changed the rules, which did punish uh, many who are self-employed. Well, it drove the revenue director out of Missouri. That's, that's correct. <laughs> One of the other things that you really ran into was that um, there's a divide in how we give back money. Um, Democrats within the state house really pushed for tax relief for uh, sales tax on food and other goods, and Republicans primarily pushed for tax relief for those who offshore money and foreign tax havens, which we of course oppose. That, that, Only that, those people not, would get. Uh, but, they would get a, a very large back. share. And and I will tell you, as somebody with family in Jamaica, I would appreciate it. But I don't know how many Kansans actually have money in foreign tax havens that they would appreciate well, quickly. But, but, but they, but again, are, are people with money in, in foreign tax havens the only ones who would benefit from... No, of course from. not. And, and, and that's a classic example of what he just described as, as a misdirection. This is not providing tax relief 
to companies with foreign profits. It's saying we're going to continue to not tax income in Kansas that wasn't earned in Kansas. This is a new tax they want to apply, which they can because of the tax reform at the federal level. This isn't providing tax relief to anyone. They're also, and as far as um, not being able to deduct all your state and local income tax, property tax, yes. and so forth, that's, that was a, a uh, I mean, it's controversial, but it's, it's because some states, including Kansas, have high tax rates. And what that does is subsidize uh, the states with, that have lower ones because people have to, uh, you know, it, you, you get a bigger federal tax rate off without and, it. Any if, if this is a time to be cautious in Kansas, should the governor keep talking about Medicaid expansion? Medicaid expansion and uh, they're underwater on their pension mm -hmm. and funding. And so they've got some, some items at home that are big ticket items that need immediate attention. And um, mm -hmm. they're kind of getting in the weeds on this salt yeah. tax and these things, but they really need to pay attention to what's going on at home. Well, Medicaid expansion, we're often told, is funded like 90% by the federal, federal government. government. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. But that still means, what, 10% 10%. that the state has to pick up. and. One never knows for sure when the federal government might change right. that structure. Would you agree? I, I, I certainly agree, but I do think can care. It's a discussion that's been on the table for years, and, and I think it's important that they consider to look at that because there are some structural imbalances ahead in Kansas with, with population growth, with sales tax revenue, with a lot of things. Eastern uh, Kansas continues to be the engine of growth. I think you have to look at healthcare. You have to look at education. I, I would caution that that investing too much in new spending, introducing multiple new spending programs, would go the other direction in imbalancing the budget for the future. Final question: uh, Go around to a couple of people. Uh, Supreme Court, a couple of months is going to look at this ninety million dollars increase in the school finance yeah. budget for four years. Think the court will reject that or accept it? The court's in a, in a, a real pickle here, because, and it's, it's all political. Again, this, this is nothing to do with the rule of law. It's about politics. They definitely want to provide cover to Governor Kelly, but they also uh, don't want to be cowed into saying 90 million is enough. Of course, whether it's 90 million a year or 360 million a year, not a penny of it's going to make any difference to the kids, and that's what this is all about. It would only exacerbate the budget deficit. Chris, you think Supreme Court will say 90 million or more think, for four years is enough? I think that they will. I, I don't think that this is is as politically motivated as Mr. Trabert thinks that it is. I think this Trabert. is one, uh, Trabert thinks that He's it is. He's correct me apologies. when I've said it. That's okay. That's <laughs> one of the apologies. nicer things I gave. <laughs> um, uh, I think that we have finally hit a point where there was broad consensus amongst Republicans and Democrats. Remember, this is still a Republican-controlled mm -hmm. legislature that passed this this compromise, and I think that the Supreme Court will see this as a good faith effort. You think the school districts will say ninety million is enough? That we're going to have to You know they're not going to. They already have said, I think, is, right. that it's not enough. They won't. Anyway, only the most secluded and optimistic of us, maybe Trappist monks, <laughs> believe the Mueller report would end the debate <laughs> over Donald Trump's fitness to be president. While the report cleared the president of collusion with Russia, it also raised questions about possible obstructions of justice. As we often hear in political stories, opinions are divided along party lines. Many, not all, but many Republicans think that Trump is vindicated and en route to a second term. Many, but not all, Democrats want him impeached. No president has ever been re impeached and removed from office. Should Donald Trump be the first? We'll start with Chris and then go to Annie. First, I think there's a bad assumption here, and that is, is that this report cleared Trump of collusion. Just because... Well, that's what it said. It actually does <laughs> well, not. Well, actually it did. No, no. Uh, although Attorney General Barr does say that, that wasn't the focus of the report. The focus of the report was on the way that the campaign worked and interactions. Not collusion is a term that that is a little bit more vague, but we have to look at the fact that uh, Mueller links to more than 12 other ongoing... Uh, investigations, including that of SDNY, which just this morning received more documentation from Swiss banks. Uh, we have come away with several convictions, including uh, the pleadings of the, the former uh, deputy chair of the RNC Finance. Um, these are big happenings. Now, uh, the one thing that I took away from this is that Trump continues to come out and yell and scream how transparent he is. But what we learned from the report was that he refused to sit for an interview 
which is something that hasn't happened. And he's trying to change the definition of what establishes um, unfit behavior. In 1993, the Supreme Court established that high crimes and misdemeanors is a political term, not a legal term, uh, definitively in Nixon versus the United States. And now we're seeing Trump wanting to change that. Well, I think it's up to the legislators, the U.S. House, to at least have a hearing, see the documents in full, and then decide what we're going I, to do. I thought that the Mueller report said uh, there was no evidence of Trump's involvement with Russia or any other American. Did I just misread that, that line? What it basically said is there's no provable way okay. to get there. So which there was no difference. indictment, no charge against Trump or anybody else on well, collusion with in Russia. In this case... I, I got to move on, yeah. but is that right? I, I you don't, don't agree. Think that okay, Annie. Right. Uh, so, people sometimes get confused. Impeach means the House levies a charge articles. or charges. Uh, conviction has to be done by the Senate, Senate. by two thirds of the Senate. So uh, we've had two presidents impeached but not convicted. Uh, will Trump be the first who is impeached and convicted? I'm not even no. sure they'll go for impeachment, no, but won't. I can no. assure you he will not be convicted. So it's a waste of time mm -hmm. to continue fishing <laughs> throughout this. $17 million report that we spent two years on to determine whether or not Trump allowed Putin to assist him in beating Hillary Clinton, which is basically what the whole question was. I think we've got a lot more articles of information that we need to find out about, including immigration, infrastructure, all those kinds of things. But the most important thing we learned from this report was that our voting system nationally is vulnerable. Yeah. And we have now broadcasted to the entire earth that you can mess with our votes in seven mm -hmm. states in particular. And I hate to believe that the outcome will change as a result of our broadcast in this continued fishing expedition. Uh, John, uh, from your perspective, what was the purpose of the Mueller report? Well, I, I mean, I... What, what was the charge to Mueller? What was he supposed to investigate? Well, I, you know, like with any, with any investigation like that, obviously it was it started with collusion in Russia, but you go where the investigation leads you. That's common principle in, investi mm -hmm. in investigations. And he went through collusion, corruption, all these other issues. And, and as people have said, I think SDNY and others are going to carry those banners. But I think it's interesting. I, I actually agree with Speaker Pelosi that we have a lot of other issues. We don't need the distraction of an impeachment, articles of impeachment, but we should continue to ask questions and investigate where there is evidence that should be investigated while we carry on with the rest of business of America. Dave, we know now that Joe Biden is going to enter the uh, Democratic uh, race mm -hmm. for the presidential nomination, in fact, has already entered. Mm -hmm. Do you think he becomes the leading uh, contender and the most likely to be nominated? It, you know, it's hard to say, Mike. I think uh, he's certainly going to be, uh, the polls indicate he's near the top, and that might be name recognition. It's going to be interesting to see as I think some of the, uh, the the dozen or so or more who are out there now start to fall off, mm -hmm. whether their supporters go for, lean more toward Bernie's proposals for free stuff and socialism or Biden's basic anger. Right, Chris, how about Biden? Is that the kind of guy you and, and people in your Group would support. I, I think that there are a lot of people who will be attracted to uh, to former Vice President Biden. Um, he does stand out in the current political climate. He is somebody who has done things like releases yeah. tax returns and not have affairs with porn stars. Some and people those, say, are gonna, those are going to stand out. Some people say he's too moderate for the progressive way. I, I think that I think that when you have a field of twenty plus. Uh, people will find a reason to vote for someone instead mm -hmm. of against someone, and I think that's good for all of our And it's said that Democrats want somebody who can win. That's the that's, main concern. That is true. Not so concerned mm -hmm. about white, black, female, male, but or liberal, socialist, whatever. They just want somebody who will win. All right, now we're going to head to the soapbox for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckets have 30 seconds each to imply, deny, or defy. And let's start with John. I'd like to give a roast to the newly resurgent anti-vaxxer movement. Uh, measles outbreaks in America are at their highest level since 2000 when the CDC declared measles fundamentally eliminated. Um, vaccines are proven to be safe time and time again for decades. And the um, anti-vax positions are ultimately nothing more than conspiracy theories. And while you might not want to vaccinate your child and you may think that inherently your child will be safe or that they will not be affected by measles or other illnesses or diseases, think of the vulnerable children that are going through cancer treatments, pregnant women, and others with compromised immune systems. 
millions of Americans that don't have that luxury and may be exposed due to you your anti vaccine you move along, Chris? This week, I'm going to roast, roast uh, Senator Jim Dennings. Uh, in a recent meeting with Governor Kelly, he had four hours to discuss whether or not Kansas would proceed on Medicaid. Rather than do that, the meeting ended at one hour as the Republicans left, saying that they wouldn't advance this to a vote within the Senate on May 1st, and instead will look forward to crafting a new piece of legislation next year full of poison pills to try and get a veto. The public deserves to have a yes or no vote. If he's opposed to Medicaid expansion, as some of his conservative base are, he should vote no. If he favors it, he should vote yes. Transparency. Uh, Annie, quickly. Toast to our Henry Block. <laughs> he was a great human and was just an amazing role model for all of Kansas City. He will be missed. Dave. A roast to mainstream media, with present company excluded, Mike. Uh, <laughs> their coverage. Mainstream? <laughs> Their coverage of the Kansas budget situation has been predictably political and uh, misleading. The, uh, it's designed to provide cover to a governor and to legislators whose policies are setting Kansas up for a huge tax increase. Uh, media should be honest and unbiased, not the fourth branch of government. All right, I'm going to have to pass on a toast or roast this week. I'll get it in next week, and that is Ruckus. That's all the time we have for this week. Back next week at 7 o'clock. Now for the Ruckets and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks for watching, and good night.